Welcome to Making It with Terry Woolman, the show that explores the secrets, successes, and strategies for making it in the music biz. And now, here's your host, Terry Woolman. Welcome to Making It with me, your host, Terry Woolman. I really appreciate you joining us each week, and I'd like to thank Blue Microphones for their technical support in helping continue to bring our show to you during this world health pandemic. Please continue to stay mindful and safe as we all work together as a global community. I hope you find my recent conversations with artists Gino Vanelli, Boney James, Tony Basil, Peter Erskine, Berkeley College of Music President Roger Brown, and 90-year-old Auschwitz survivor Rose Schindler inspiring, comforting, and entertaining. Also, be sure to check out our episode featuring the new Netflix documentary Crip Camp, A Disability Revolution with directors Nicole Noonan and James LeBret. The film is executive produced by Barack and Michelle Obama. I created this show to focus on what it takes to create and maintain a lasting career in the ever-changing landscape of the music and entertainment business. My guest today is Bob James. Let me tell you a little bit about Bob. The career of Bob James is long, varied, and continues to evolve at every turn. From his childhood in Marshall, Missouri, to present day, the music of this artist has captivated audiences throughout the world. Discovered by Quincy Jones in 1963, James recorded his first solo album, Bold Conceptions, that year for Mercury Records. 58 albums and worldwide recognition would follow through five decades as an award-winning pianist, composer, music director, and producer. While James has established himself as a true original in the jazz world, his music has also had a profound effect on the history of hip hop. His songs Nautilus and Take Me to Mardi Gras are among the most sampled in hip hop history. Bob James, welcome to Making It. Hi, Jerry. Hi, Bob. Very much a pleasure to in these crazy times. Well, crazy times they are. You you couldn't have said it better. Uh, First of all, uh, you are isolated, like um, we are here, my wife and I. Uh, but you are you are really staying away from people, and but, but you're using your time wisely. Yeah, you know, what what have you been up to lately, and how have you been adjusting to the pandemic? I uh, live in northern Michigan, so I'm kind of away from the worst of the firing line in terms of the crowded big cities. And uh, Michigan has had more than its share of cases, but mostly down in the southern part in the Detroit area. So uh, I feel a little bit more secure up here, but but primarily I got my piano and uh, the piano has been my uh, good friend for my whole career, but it's a much, much better friend right now. Uh, Terry, I never liked practicing uh, from the very, very early days. My mother made me practice, and so I started off in a bad way, thinking that practicing was punishment or something that you just had to do, even though you didn't want to do it. And now I just regret so much that I didn't, or I wasn't able to take advantage of that major aspect of making music, practicing. And now, I, I guess, Hopefully, before it's too late, I'm playing catch up. And part of it is just the practical reason that I don't have anything else to do. Uh, and over the last two months, I'm just loving it. I, I, at the beginning of the day, I look forward to it. Uh, and I'm trying different things with the piano that I never took the time to do in my life. Uh, and the only weird part of it is, is that I'm doing all of this practicing, but uh, uh, I don't have any concerts to play it on. Right. It's just, uh, most of the time I'm playing for myself, but occasionally uh, I'll, I'll have somebody come over and stay 20 feet away from me or whatever. And, uh, but other than that, it's just uh, a lot of interaction with my piano. How... Uh, you know, I had read that you didn't like practicing, and that was part of the reason that you liked jazz, or that, that you know that it, there was um, more freedom for you, um, in some ways maybe less disciplined, even though it's an incredibly disciplined uh, area yeah. of music. But how did how did you 
get to the level of your playing without learning how to really enjoy practicing? Did you just have a natural gift where you yeah. always just kind of connected to the instrument? Question. My whole, my whole hypothesis or my, my whole idea back then was just completely wrong. That, that for some reason or other, I did have it in my mind that I wanted to play jazz because you didn't have to practice. <laughs> well, that's, that's really silly. And all, all of the, the great, you know, don't tell me that Oscar Peterson never practiced or that Keith Jarrett doesn't practice or whatever. Yes, we, we do uh, to whatever varying degrees. And I, uh, I guess I would say that I was able to practice on the firing line which is, I guess, is some form of, of practicing if you're doing it a, a lot. Um, and, and I can't say that I didn't practice at all. Yes, I did. I just didn't like it. And it didn't seem like fun to me. Or it didn't, I didn't understand the power, or the, the fun part of it. That's the thing that I feel like is mostly I'm learning right now. It's so interesting to hear you say that because one of the things that I've always gotten out of your playing especially when I see you playing, you know, live in performance videos or Hollywood Bowl, Playboy Jazz Festival, you know, places I've seen you play, you seem to be having a lot of fun, you know, in playing music. You're a very joyful player. So you you definitely didn't lose that aspect of music. Thank you very much for saying it. And definitely that's, uh, um, very, very important for me. And I like to be able to, to put across my own personality or my own voice when I'm playing. And I'm the most comfortable when I'm not trying to be somebody else or not trying to, to do what I think somebody else thinks I should do. If, if I can be myself and if something strikes me funny, maybe a, a deliberate wrong note or some quote from some obscure um, uh, song or something like that. If any of those things at the right time come out in the same way that they would if I was in a social conversation right. away from the piano. And yes, I love to have fun. And I, in the live performance, a circumstance where I could feel it coming back at me from the audience, where they get it or uh, appreciate it, that's, that's uh, a dream scenario for me. I love it. Are you are you set up? I know since you're playing so much music right now, and sort of redefining your relationship with the the piano. Are you able to record at home? Do you have a home studio? I do. I'm, I have an embarrassment of uh, pianos <laughs> all over the place, uh, and <laughs> synthesizers, and a, a computer workstation. Uh, I, I don't really have a recording studio as such. I, I would not be able to record drums or uh, other than maybe one other instrument at a time. I could sort of do it, but I don't, I don't have any engineering expertise myself for doing that. So mostly if I'm, the, the things that I'm able to record professionally is if I'm overdubbing my own solo on somebody's project, I can do a pretty good job of, of making my piano sound as good as it would in a recording studio. Uh, well, that's good to know. I might, might you know, I'm making a new record. <laughs> I might circle back and, <laughs> and leave some space for you. Um, I was just thinking well, that. You, it's, been the most, it's the most fun thing uh, going right now is to get asked to uh, play on something uh, and realize that I can take the gig because it's actually going to happen and I don't have to get on an airplane to go to L.A. to do it. Right, and you have the time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I wonder I, if this would be a good time. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, it's, I, I, wonder, I wonder if this is a good time to share a story with you uh, that just happened related to that, and I, I love the idea of sharing it anyway. Of course. But uh, uh, my friend Dave Cos, who I'm sure you probably know, Dave, mm -hmm. uh, he and I were both uh, asked to do a little virtual at-home video thing for Sandy Shore, who, who runs the smoothjazz.com website. And sure. I've known Sandy for many years. And uh, she had asked me to do an at-home 
short thing, just like a five minute kind of promo, but uh, playing and talking. So in, to set up for it, uh, I went to their website and I noticed that Dave Koz had just done one for her. So I was able to kind of check it out to see how he did his, to see if I could learn anything from it. And on his, uh, he was at his house and sitting on the sofa, uh, just playing the sax and no band or anything else, very, very casual. And he announced that he had just written the song, a brand new song. And I think maybe he had just written it that morning. So it was really, really hot off the press. <laughs> and he played it. And I liked it. I thought the melody was pretty cool. So uh, I, at, at, in a kind of crazy spur of the moment idea, I transcribed it uh, and decided that I would play it on my video for <laughs> Sandy Shore. Uh, and so I did my at home thing talking and I announced that I had written it and that, that morning. I didn't say, at the beginning, I didn't say anything about Dave Cobb. I just told my viewers that uh, I came up with this melody and it's hot off the press and I just couldn't wait to share it. So I played it. And then at the end, um, I just said, you know, um, I can't tell a lie. I didn't write that at all. <laughs> it was written. It was written by Dave Cos, and I hope he won't mind if I pretend it just a little bit. But and it also happened to be April Fool's Day. So oh, I, perfect! Uh, that day, so back. So, I, uh, so I had a lot of fun, and, and fortunately, you know, you're taking a little bit of risk that maybe he'll take it the wrong way and not be happy about it. But he loved it, and he got back to me immediately and thanked me, and we laughed about it, and it was great. Well, now that was two months, two months ago, or hopefully maybe three months ago, <laughs> and time has marched on. He went to the studio to re record the official version of this song, and uh, I'm the featured soloist on it. Oh. <laughs> so uh, he invited me to guest on his new, new record, and I... It turns out that I scammed my way onto Dave Cobb's record. <laughs> <laughs> so lying actually and pays off. <laughs> oh, yeah, it totally paid off. And, <laughs> and just in terms of what you were asking me about, about recording things at home or in my studio, I, I did my part here. And so the saga continues. <laughs> That's great. I'm I'm going to go listen to the song and the video. And the video that you did for Sandy Shore sounds a lot more interesting than the one that I did for Sandy. Yeah, because <laughs> I didn't I didn't lie about anything or make anything up. And that, that sounds great. Um, I and I actually remember the song because I remember when Dave played it too. I remember the melody. So uh, I'm looking forward to hearing that song. Yeah, I, I stole it, but then I couldn't <laughs> quite pull off. Yeah, I had to admit. So uh, before we get into your early years and your career, which has been really pretty remarkable, but also really fun to follow. Uh, and just a quick overview, uh, you know, you started playing piano when you were four years old, and I want to ask you about that in a minute. There's, I want to talk about something else first, but, but you've gone on to, to being a session player and arranger, producer, um, even you know helping you know A and R at a major record label, you you have definitely been pretty fearless, and and also very creative, you know throughout your whole career, in embracing things around you, and it's been really cool to watch and pretty inspiring, um, you know for me to see that because, you know it's it's artists like you and Dave Grusin and Quincy Jones. Uh, who inspired me to to know that I could be more than just a guitar player, you know, like yourself, you know, like to become a producer and an arranger and do a podcast and that it's all connected, you know. So where did you, was that something your parents taught you about how everything's connected or were you just kind of fearless about stepping into any opportunity that was presented to you and, somehow managing to not let it compromise your musicianship, but, but evolve your musicianship. 
I don't know. I don't know the, the, the answer, but just the, sometimes just the way life evolves creates that. And you can look back on it and realize that you did it, but while you were doing it, you, you didn't know exactly. Um, I, I, could, I could say that having a college education at the University of Michigan in a really great music school in a very broad environment that wasn't specifically jazz, in fact, it, there was no jazz department when I went to college there. So I was primarily studying classical music and getting involved with other things and musical theater. And, and I had a, an interest or a curiosity about it. And I think going maybe back to some instincts in high school, I liked the idea of arranging or orchestrating. Or, and I was very curious about all of that, the sound, how the what was the, what were the ranges of the instruments and how did that all happen and trying to copy it and everything so that was very much a, a part of my mindset and moving to new york uh, uh looking for gigs you never know where that gig is going to come from and whether they might be asking you to do a polka or a cha-cha or whatever else and if you if you know the basics of it and can deliver it, then you get the job. So I, I actually think back on a very, very important time that my wife helped me with because I, I became very concerned at some point that I was jack of all trades, master of none. The, the too, trying to do too many things and never really focusing in to, to develop the virtuosity or the, the, the high level skills that I lusted for. And there again, this, this, uh, this lack of commitment to practicing was part of all of that too. But what my wife told me at that time was essentially, um, that's probably not who you are. You're not the person that is a single focus person and just be yourself and allow yourself to be all those things because they're coming out naturally. You're gravitating to them for some reason. And yes, okay, maybe you can't be the best of any one of the things that you do, but the fact that you could do a lot of them forms your personality, she told me at that time. And uh, it, it's suddenly I sort of got it. I sort of was able to, to, uh, relax and and say it's okay that I do all that and it's also okay that I'm never going to become Glenn Gould and Vladimir Horowitz and Oscar Peterson and Keith Jarrett and all those other people that I lust after <laughs> not going to be able to do it but but maybe some combination of what I do ends up being um, special. You know, you're you're talking about your wife Judy, and you and she were married for 53 years. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Can I can I read a quote that you yeah. said about her because it really speaks to what you're talking about? Do you mind? I found it on your website. Uh, no. You I'm said. Re, you said she was my best friend, best critic, and advisor the love of my life, her uncanny ability to understand, appreciate, and get to the basic root values of art made it possible for me to pursue my career. I feel her presence in every note, every gesture. Yeah. Yeah. I, that really, wow. that's, oh. that speaks to what you just said. Yeah, and when you're together with somebody for that long, we were, uh, we knew we were going to end up getting married four or five years before that because we dated all the way through college. So she was with me at the formative times and um, I would not even be uh, anywhere close to, to the only person that would describe her in that way. She had very powerful impact on all of her friends. She was just very straightforward, clear-headed, um, no bullshit, if you'll excuse the expression, mm -hmm. uh, 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 person. And, and I was the beneficiary of it. So, so uh, she's uh, been gone a little more than three years now, but uh, uh, 
I still feel her presence all the time, especially when it's anything um, uh, difficult decision or make me pull myself together and not go off course. I, mm -hmm. I try to remember back on the things that did to help keep me on course. Uh, you were lucky to have each other. I think so. I yeah. Hope so. I hope she felt the same way. <laughs> very, very. Uh, so there's there's something else that that came to my attention that prompted me reaching out to you this week uh, to have you on the show. Not just the music, but the video that that you put out that was entitled "Black Lives Matter" to me. And it really touched me. Uh, and I know that uh, it's something that was very personal to you because I could feel your heart uh, in, in you know, watching and listening to the video. And so I want to talk about it for a moment. And you started the video by, I wrote it down because I, it, again, it profoundly moved me. And you started it by saying, Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter to me. Black Lives Matter a lot to me. I'm a white jazz pianist and composer, and Black Lives shape my life. Can you, I know what you mean, because I know your, your music history, but can you explain to people that are listening why Black Lives Matter and why you felt compelled to do this? And, and the video, and I'm going to put a, we're going to put a link to it so everybody can see it, but you just start listing names of people that you love that have impacted you in your life. And tell me what, how, how I've been at a loss as a white person, as a, as a musician as well. My wife is black. So I'm, I'm very um, immersed in, in information that's going on every day. And I felt inadequate in what to say at points. I've had moments of clarity where I speak, but where did your clarity come from to do that? Well, uh, this kind of a interview is the thing that I was the most nervous about and maybe terrified about because I don't feel I'm qualified to be spokesman by any means. I, I'm not a crusader. I'm not a, uh, this, the little video I made, very spur of the moment, very much. Uh, it came to me before I went to bed this one night, I was kind of thinking that I'm way away from, I'm seeing these demonstrations going on in all different cities and places that I used to live and work in New York and LA. But now I'm, I'm, a, I'm away from it. I'm not doing anything. And I'm feeling out of it and almost as if I was hiding, not deliberately, but, but just, I don't know, feeling an obligation, but also kind of helpless. What, what the heck can I do? I can't really do anything. Um, but as this started to unfold, I, maybe Judy, my wife, was uh, doing it for me. She was much closer to the theater than I was, and our best friend, Jack O'Brien, who lives in New York, is a Broadway director, and he was guiding me. Even though I didn't talk to him, I didn't, I didn't call him to ask him anything about it, but I was channeling them, my theater best friends in my life, who, who I got to see how they deliver lines, deliver themselves uh, in, a, in a kind of... Um, theatrical situation. Uh, I mean, not that I was acting exactly, but I wanted to get my point across clearly, simply, didn't want to preach. I just wanted to say it. So I felt that the more direct that I could be, I better write it out because we know in this, this delicate time that we're in, uh, one word that you say in the wrong way can spend it Totally off in the wrong direction. And I was desperately trying, and and I tested myself out with my little script before I actually uh, hit the record button. But we know enough in our music field with that take one 
that if, if you get take one right, then you're probably never going to get it any better than that. And the way my script was going, if 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 I'd made a mistake on the 60th name that I was trying to thank on there and had to start all over again, it would uh, it, it, it would really not work. So I, I did one take only, and I stumble on one name toward the end. I figured I probably would anyway because I was getting so nervous by that time. Um, and and then and then I just sent it off. It didn't think too much more about it, but I was definitely nervous seeing how many things get misinterpreted and, and overinterpreted and deliberately misinterpreted. Uh, 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 so but after I really started thinking about it, it was too late. I mean, it was out there <laughs> and I started to kind of realize that it was going to get more attention than any of my noodling around at the piano was, was getting. Uh, uh, but I can say, Terry, uh, no bad reactions have, have come in, either by text or so many of my friends called me and, uh, and thanked me and gave me the good feeling that they knew where my heart was and what I wanted to say. And I, I only explained very briefly about the white guy in the black jazz world, but I wanted to, to make that understood that, that there is this, which we even used to call reverse prejudice that goes on where the, there were some black musicians that kind of didn't want me in or didn't want any of the white guys in there. Uh, and, that was my learning process during that whole period of time. And I, I learned so much, uh, among other things, that the better the, the musician was, the less problem that there was, because they were hearing music, uh, not any other kind of agenda. And if, what I basically had to do was play the music. And if I could really play it, I got in. And if, and if I wasn't cut that, I wouldn't get in. Uh, so I, I, I just said that stuff a little bit because again, I did not want to preach. I didn't want to do anything like that. But I wanted just to have people realize that I was talking about my life, a white guy's life, but I lived my life in the black community. And the, the bulk of my fans, my, my most loyal fans, and the very high percentage of the musicians that I played with and been friends with for my whole life were much more in the black community than they were in the white community. And it remains that way to this day. Um, um, so that's what I did. I, I wonder if that's part of the reason that, that your video spoke to me so deeply because that's been my experience as well. You know, my my mentors are Joe Sample and, you know, Abraham Laboriel Sr., you know, the, the people that, um, you know, I've never made a record without Abraham, you know, as, as long as I've been doing it. it. And, you know, people that have deeply touched my life and helped form me, not just as a musician, but also just as a, in being a good, a better person. Yeah, and I think we have the best chance of influencing in some way other white people who may have that prejudice that's built in on whatever level that it's in there that they may not even know that it's in there. Mm -hmm. And if, if we are not afraid to talk about it and not afraid to represent ourselves as, as uh, representatives of being able to say that Black Lives Matter to us, then uh, at the very least, they have to take us seriously about it. Well, thank you for being courageous enough to, to, you know, speak your heart and put the video out. And I'm glad nobody got hurt, you know, because I think it's important to speak out and, and it's nobody's job right now, uh, black or white, to be, 
to feel the weight of, of thinking that they need to be the spokesperson you know, for everything. It's just mm -hmm. speaking what's personally, you know, your personal truth and perspective. And do it for us, just do it one person at a time. Be, uh, be a good representative, right. how that is. There's things like just the, the movement, Black Lives Matter movement, the three words have conjured up a whole bunch of complicated and weird debate stuff that, well, the people that will say all lives matter. <laughs> and then now you're an hour into a completely, <laughs> maybe even loony conversation that just that, that, that's not even worth trying to explain the difference and why why that's not a good answer when I'm trying to tell you that these black people meant my whole life and that's that was my life and it matters. And, right. Well, sure, all other lives matter, but that's not really the point. Is it? No, it's not. So anyway, we don't have to uh, beat up on it. Uh, thank you for uh, bringing it up because I know that I'm going to probably regularly be asked. Well, I, I wanted about, people... Uh, uh, you're welcome, Bob. I, I wanted people to understand the, the bigger picture of what your background was and why it, would, it was just made perfect sense for you to do that. So, um, so thanks for sharing a little bit more of, of your backstory on that so that people really get the intention and, and understand why um, it's perfectly the right thing to do at the right time. Thank so, you. yeah, you, of course, you're welcome. Uh, S S Quincy Jones was very influential in your career. You know, he, from what I understand, he helped you get your start on a, or basically put you to, the, you know, kind of the front of the line when he heard you play at a festival. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. kind of an understatement that he helped my career. <laughs> because he was very critical at a number of different really important times. That first one being the college jazz festival that I was performing in, and he was one of the judges. So that, that was major in many, many ways. It was one of the reasons why I got enough confidence to move to New York after that and totally pursue my career. Um, but... I was lucky timing, very, very lucky timing, because it was the beginning of his career also. And as his career skyrocketed, the fact that I was a little bit on the ground floor with him and had made an impression on him and a friendship with him that has lasted uh, throughout my whole career. And uh, we all like to have some kind of badge, you know, <laughs> I don't think I would have actually worn a Quincy Jones badge on my shirt, but I, I would maybe come close to that uh, uh, just because that gets you in the door very often. And there were a lot of other people that I would have wanted to put their name as a badge to for mm -hmm. long, et cetera, et cetera. So what uh, was it, what was it yes, like, Bob, moving yeah. to New York at, at that point? You know, was, like, is, was it a lot different than now? I mean, did you just go there and based on your talent and the confidence that you got from your, you know, getting to know Quincy, did you just start doing sessions and playing in clubs and getting arranging work or, you know, or did you have to drive a cab for a year? You know, what, what was your first year like in New York? Well, uh, you brought up my wife, Judy. Uh, yeah. Thank you for bringing that up because it gives me the opportunity to, to, to explain about our move to New York because we moved right after we got married and almost immediately uh, after our honeymoon, uh, we moved. And it's amazing to me to this day, and I still cannot quite figure out why she put up with it, but both of us had master's degree. And we, we had very, very solid education, but I had no job and no, no uh, inkling that there were gonna be a job. I don't even remember why I got up the 
the courage or the craziness for us to get in our car and move and get an apartment. And I wasn't even looking for a job. I didn't, I was very involved with avant-garde music at that time. And I had a little bit of notoriety and, and I had had my little uh, Quincy Jones encounter and all that at a college event. But this was New York City. And then there were plenty of other people much further down the line that would be getting whatever few jobs there were in jazz. There weren't, there weren't that many half a dozen club and uh, I wasn't going to be one of the ones who was going to get the job. It would certainly be uh, Bill Evans or it would be uh, on and on and on. Where I was on that list was way, 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 way down. But but Terry, I wasn't thinking about it. I I was listening to some other avant-garde music and my wife taught school. She got a job because she had a teaching degree and she ended up getting a, te a teaching job up in Harlem uh, and uh, took a bus to get up there, the subway, and then got off the subway and got on the bus. And 145th Street was where her school was that she was teaching. And for pretty much the first, at least the first year that we were in New York, my contribution to our uh, budget was nearly zero. And, <laughs> And I'm embarrassed to even admit it after all this time because eventually I, was, I, I did a little bit better than that. You eventually more it. than made up for but that, but yes. Stuck, <laughs> you know, and she stuck with me. It was, it was her uh, patience or something. I don't know. But, and we were, we were naive and we liked New York and I, I, I had a little bit of a little bit of financial backing from my father still at that time. So it, it, we weren't trying to go to New York broke and desperate to get something happening. But, but it, was a, it was a very naive and very um, adventurous decision mm -hmm. to move. Nothing like thinking that I was going to be getting moved to the recording booth. And that fortunately came later, but... Um, what I considered my first actual job where I got a little bit of predictable money was with Sarah Vaughn. And that was about two and a half, three years after we had been in New York. And I had very few other actual paid jobs before that. Hmm. Uh, I did work for six months with Maynard Ferguson uh, and as his pianist with his band. Mm -hmm. But touring, the little bit of touring that we did, there was no money involved, and there was uh, a lot of chemicals going on within the band that sure. I didn't approve of and mm -hmm. didn't want to go that path. So I pulled away from that, and um, and it had one big highlight that also influenced my life a lot was the the fact that we played Birdland in New York, um, one of our gigs, which was the old 52nd Street Birdland. They, mm -hmm. they moved their different locations. To it. Right. At that time, it was the original one. And um, into the club came Sarah Vaughn. And mm. Maynard met her and asked her to sit in. And, and uh, of course, in that situation, the pianist usually panics because, of course, she didn't come in with any arrangements. So there was there was nothing for the big band to do to play behind her. But you you know that the pianist is going to get the task to play. And so when she walked over the piano, she's already hoping hoping that she would play want to sing something simple, misty or something that I that I knew. Mm -hmm. And she came over to the piano and said, do you know the sweetest sound? Which was at that time a very, very obscure thing for a singer to mm -hmm. ask because it was a brand new song that had just opened Broadway, uh, the, the uh, No String, a musical that started by Carol. And Sarah had been in the studio to record it, or she knew it, and she, she was in the middle of working on it. So. Uh, Miraculously, uh, 
very, very good luck was with me because I was able to say, well, yeah, yes, uh, what key? What key do you want to do it in? And so I, with, you know, with the motto, I, I made it sound like uh, there was no big deal that I'd, I probably knew every song that you could name. <laughs> but it was just luck. That, right. Again, my two friends who were in musical theater had hooked me up because I was listening much more to musical theater than a normal jazz guy would playing with Maynard Ferguson. And so I knew it, and I was okay with the key that she chose, and uh, I, I played reasonably good <laughs> job of doing it for her mm -hmm. and it was less than maybe six months after that a few months after that when her pianist uh, ron albright who was playing with her at the time decided to leave and maynard had given me the opportunity to have a much better audition than i would have ever gotten otherwise oh absolutely so I got yeah the job with her as a result of it. did having perfect pitch help you through that uh that experience as well, or or was it pretty much just because you had been getting exposed to Broadway and theater music? Um, Portrait Pitch was a very, very big help to me in all kinds of ways, uh, arranger and whatever, but we don't probably want to go into the other side of that too much, sure. but I am right. on the other side of the pitch uh, phenomenon now because I don't have it anymore. In fact, it's even in my old, older age, uh, and I have talked to a couple of other older musician friends who had perfect pitch or having a similar thing that I had, which is it's kind of worse than no perfect pitch because I still hear all those notes in my head, but they're wrong. They're now it started out being somewhere in the vicinity of a, of a half tone wrong. Now I'm as much as a whole poem, mm. high, mm. and I have to go through the whole little thing to pull myself back. If, if I'm playing the piano and if I'm oriented, and my fingers are telling me where I am, and now I'm fine. But if I'm just listening to something else, my brain is telling me so strongly mm. that it's these other notes based on this long history of knowing it was those notes. So I, I, I was bulletproof. 40 years ago, sure. Uh, uh, I could hear clusters and everything else, and, and it helped me with my arranging. But but now I better have a piano next to me to get get me back on track uh, if, if I'm trying to transcribe or anything else because I don't have it anymore. I that's really interesting. I I didn't know about that. Um, that perfect pitch could could change with age. I I have plenty of friends, mutual friends of ours, uh, Nathan East, Gerald Albright, perfect pitch. We've always had fun on stage playing together with kind of testing each other yeah. and and uh but but and I don't have it. I've I've got relative pitch, but um but I also know that it can be quite a distraction for a lot of people. So uh, for many, many reasons. Uh I wanted to yeah. ask you I, I, you know, when you're talking about this, the Sarah Vaughan opportunity, um, I remember reading about your, I believe your very first gig, you were eight years old and you played for a tap dance company. Is yeah. that accurate? Yeah. How, <laughs> I, like I, I, I just, I, remember I, I, I got fired. Though. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that that might speak to the the question that that I'm getting ready to ask you, which is, how did that very first gig uh, prepare you, you know, for other things that have come along your way in in your career? And I would imagine getting fired <laughs> would be, you know, a good example of what you needed to learn to be ready to be in the music business. Yeah, and and having chosen jazz, the <laughs> fact that I got I heard for not being able to keep the beat was a very big part of it. And, mm -hmm. and I learned that I better learn a little bit of something about rhythm. Because rhythm could be important to me and has, <laughs> has continued to be extremely important uh, to keep the beat. Otherwise, in jazz, you definitely get fired. How did, how did you, um, and at what point, especially since you were working in avant-garde jazz when you first moved to New York, 
uh, how did you become a pocket player, like such a strong groove player? W were you just back, were you working with a metronome and, and really taking more of a personal responsibility for groove and inner, this inner sense of where an inner clock? How did you learn that? How'd you get good at that? I think I must have, as most of the steps along the way, I must have gotten uh, associated with the right kind of players that, that it was very important that if I wasn't getting it, they would remind me about it or <laughs> one way or another, it, it would become more and more and more obvious that you better be in the pocket or you're out of a job or right. you're not going to be able to play. And I started feeling it. And I started hearing it in other players. Uh, I can share with you uh, some new project that I'm uh, very much lucky that it's happening right now. There's an engineer in, who lives in LA, you may know him, uh, George Clayton. Do you know who mm -hmm. that is? No, I don't know George, it's just George by name. Clayton. Well, his, uh, he has a couple of different labels. He, 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 he's uh, an engineer that went into producing recordings and in recent years he has done a lot of reissues of classic old recordings that he was able to get the, the rights to reissue them. And a few years ago he reissued a compilation project of, of recordings of Eric Dolphy. And mm -hmm. uh, coincidentally I was involved with uh, Eric Dolphy briefly back in my college days uh, had having invited him to come out and play on one of my avant-garde pieces that I had composed when I was in college. And, uh, and one of those pieces ended up on this recording. But in addition to that, he contacted me some months ago to tell me that he still had in his possession these two recordings that I made in 1965 in New York that he had asked my trio to come in to this studio, or it was actually a theater up in, at Columbia University in New York City, and play because he wanted to test out his equipment. It, wasn't, it was not a paid gig or anything. He, he just said, you guys can play whatever you want from your repertoire. And at that time, as I was telling you, a lot of the stuff that I was doing was in the fringe of the avant-garde. But we were also playing bebop too. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there a series of recordings, and he told me uh, they're in pristine condition, still audio great, and he wanted to put them out. And uh, it's actually going to happen. The album has a name, Once Upon a Time. And it's two different sessions from 1965, my trio. Uh, and uh, amazing that after you know, more than 50 years, uh, have the opportunity to have them see the light of day. And I totally forgot. I had no idea that they were even in existence. I hadn't kept copies of them mm -hmm. or anything. And it was only six months ago when he told me that he had them. And they're, they're going to come out. And I like having the opportunity to mention it to you uh, now because it's a very, very different side of my playing. Uh, about 50% of it is straight ahead pop kind of uh, playing, and then the other 50% is the more crazy avant garde stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, two different drummers, one of whom in particular was a guy named Omar Clay. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to mention him. I did mention him, by the way, in my Black Lives Matter thing. I went all the way back to my Ann Arbor days. The first two or three people that I mentioned were those guys that literally formed the foundation of me hearing what swing meant and trying to figure out how I could get into the middle of it without, um, without ruining the groove that I stay in the groove. <laughs> and Omar was, uh, was a, uh, just fantastic amazing pocket swing player and he's the guy that I would probably remember the most as being my first opportunity to sit there at the piano and feel like I'm floating on a cloud or something oh my god what's happening to me but there's 
the notes, when I relaxed enough, the notes just seemed to completely flow in this way, like he, he, he had me hypnotized or something. So that kind of feeling, uh, and yes, that stayed with me my whole life. I, I knew that somewhere inside me, I had something that probably can't practice to get that. You just have to have it. This is so fantastic. I'm really excited to hear the, these, these new records. When are they coming out? Um, I, I'm maybe end of summer now. I think they're maybe putting it off till September. You know, all these schedules are getting changed because mm-hmm. of the virus. And right. They have another different record that with Eddie Daniels is coming out at the end of this month uh, that I also um, played on and wrote a couple of arrangements for that too. But um, he's a really, really interesting guy. And just the fact that he's given me this opportunity to go back way back into my archives mm-hmm. and have the opportunity to have a hard bop 1965 record come out. Yeah. Uh, so great, Bob. Man, I, I can't wait to hear it. Hey, Terry. Yes. I, I, uh, I have the opportunity to ask him, you're a about this, but I just learned from a young friend who's barely 20 years old, I think, and he's telling me, maybe you know about this. It, it, I was so shocked. According to him, the latest trend in, uh, uh, in recordings, cassette. And he's involved in this kind of real out electronic music stuff. And he just released his new record, cassette, for the. I, I couldn't believe my ears. I couldn't believe that he was saying this to me. But he's, and he's selling, he's manufactured it, and he's selling them over in Europe. And he said he's already sold out his old first edition, and that it's hot now. It's a new, it's a new, I'm just, I'm speechless. No, but I'm absolutely speechless. Yeah, I'm, and I don't know. <laughs> Just... There was nothing good about that format. You know, no. At least with vinyl, it sounded good if you played the right thing. But that shocked me that vinyl would come back. But no, he's he's at the beginning of his thing, and he's wow. in this uh, pretty uh, out music that he played. But their new thing is that they're releasing it on cassette. Uh, <laughs> I could... Uh... <laughs> Wow, it's just amazing. I mean, I'm, maybe we should put out our next records on eight track. You know, it's, it's just you know, jump ahead of the curve. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> and I, I'm going to look in my garage because I think I still got some boxes. Like you said, <laughs> yeah. they, they might have a light. Yeah. I do. Yeah, I could. I could ask Raul Campos from KCRW because he's he's definitely an audiophile. He's always cutting edge. I've had him on the show, but he's he's a KCRW DJ in Los Angeles. I'll find out. I'll see what he knows because he's he's been pushing me to release on on vinyl again. You know, uh-huh. and that, I mean that makes sense. I understand that from the audiophile aspect, but cassette sure. makes z- zero sense to me. <laughs> so, other than sort of crazy trendiness, and well, yeah, which I guess that that is. Because where are they going to get a player that will play it? And even if they do, it's not going to sound good. Oh, man. I do not miss that sound. <laughs> Just, that's hysterical. Well, hey, I, I, I want to ask. Oh, go ahead. Good. Go ahead. Well, I just said there was nothing good about it. Oh, no, uh, there was uh, not. Now <laughs> enough time has passed. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. That's, that's really funny. Uh, be, before we get to our closing questions, there's there's a couple of things that I want to ask you. One of them, one of many of my favorite songs of yours that, that you've written or co-written is your collaboration with Kenny Loggins, Celebrate Me Home. And I was curious what that writing session was like. Did you did you walk in with, a, with an idea or a book of ideas or did you just show up and that's what happened? Well, I was producing uh, that record for him. Yes. That was when I was at Columbia, mm-hmm. and it was his first departure from Lagos and Messina, uh, going off on, to do his own thing. And he had told the people at Columbia before I even met him that he was interested in bringing a little bit of jazz influence into his work. And 
and that's how we met. And, uh, I guess I got recommended to him, not exactly sure how that happened, but um, immediately I want to say that although I would love to take as much credit as I possibly could take for uh, <laughs> celebrating home song, like I like I, I tried quickly to do it with Dave Cox. With, with our friend Dave, right. I, that, <laughs> yeah, I see the yeah. pattern. So <laughs> right. it might have, been, might have been a little bit that way with Teddy Lagos too, where I just kind of pretend that I wrote it. But the bottom line of that was Kenny was very much gentleman and allowed me to share in the credit for that song because he was, had basically written it and I was helping him with some ideas about the bridge, the middle right. section, and some chords. Uh, that was my contribution. Right. And even when I play it or listen back to it now, I can't even remember uh, much that I, I did. His, his song pretty much existed on its own, and he, he was just really nice. Maybe you shouldn't, if you're going to be talking to him, don't, don't tell I, that. I won't bring it up. Like no. Writer like <laughs> uh, share of that song. I, yeah, we don't I want to refer to it. it all the time. <laughs> He's not scheduled for the show, so you're yeah. safe. <laughs> uh, you know, so it's interesting yeah. to me uh, because was, Bob is a great well as a producer and arranger as well as piano player, the, the line often blurs. You know, when you are collaborating, it's a very intimate experience when done right uh, to make the kind of albums that, that you've been making, where you just sit down and, and you, you share ideas, you help form ideas. And sometimes the producer idea or the arranger idea carries over into the, the, the composition idea, uh, but, it's not um, it's not common that people get credited for that, you know. So um, the the word gentleman is a really good choice of words for for that. That you know that he was um, gracious enough to acknowledge your contribution, even if it didn't start out that way. Yeah, and maybe it's, it's when you feel vulnerable as. He and I never talked about it, or at least I don't remember talking about it, but it may have been when he was feeling a block, knowing that it had potential to be good, but somehow or other I helped him through that block, or I, I fixed a note, or I fixed a chord to say, try this, and it, it freed him up to, to take it to the finish line, and, and as a result of that, even though the the melody wasn't mine, or the basic part of it wasn't mine. Um, he, he felt better acknowledging that. Uh, and of course, maybe he also didn't know what a big hit it was going to become. Right. <laughs> if he realized how big it was yeah. going to become, he might have wanted to take a little big, big, bigger slice of it. Yeah, possibly. That wouldn't surprise me. But, uh, you know, you mentioned the, the word vulnerable. And, uh, you know, what's the importance of vulnerability as, a, as an artist, as a musician, as a producer, you know, to you? Why, why do you think that's important? I think it's extremely important. But can you elaborate on that, what I consider a quality? Well, um, being vulnerable is also being um, uh, potentially honest, being willing to uh, let go of, of, of defenses and of blocks or of covering that you might do. And the closer that you can get to revealing yourself in the most vulnerable sense, I think you get at the passion, you get at the at that mystery place that you can make people fall in love with what you do. Uh, because they, they, they feel that, they hear it, and they may not know exactly why they hear it, but I believe we can feel it in other people's music when, when that happens, when they are at their most vulnerable. Uh, and that's, uh, that's getting, 
deeper in there where the beauty is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can't always do it because a lot of times I like to protect and a lot of times I'm not willing to be completely vulnerable. Uh, but I, I think if I'm all, that's what I aim for all the time is to get as close as I can to myself. And to, this is the way I hear something and, and be, have the courage to, to let it out, to, to let go of it. What is it that you're protecting? when you're feeling like you, you don't want to be vulnerable or, or don't allow yourself to be? Uh, failure against that vulnerability of opening up, even if you do fail, or even if people hate it or don't mm -hmm. like it, or, or if it's bad or if it's not good. There's, there's a lot of ways to be safe. And there are a lot of, in, in the music field or in, in any field, if you're more conservative and more safe and stay closer to the middle of the pack or whatever, then you may not get the great good results, but you may not get the horrible bad results either. So mm -hmm. that, that's the place where if you choose to go that way, you're making yourself less vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So the, the way I'm trying to use that word, vulnerable, relates to uh, having the courage to fail and with, with the hope that having that courage also makes it an opportunity to succeed. Mm -hmm. My friend Eddie Daniels helped me with a term, he meditates a lot, and he was using the word surrender, which oh. uh, related mm -hmm. to this kind of topic. I mm -hmm. love that word. I, I, did I wouldn't have used it otherwise, but uh, that's an even better word than vulnerable. Mm -hmm. That you just surrender. That is a great word. Yeah, really, really captures the essence of, of what you're talking about. Uh, yeah. There's, you know, I think you've been, my observation is you certainly have been courageous in your career, or at least it seems from your the the library of work that you've put out, including three classical albums, you know, uh, you know your earlier jazz work, uh, you you did a Star Wars, you know, thing, uh, you know, that was a big hit earlier in your career a, arrangement, uh, the Roberta Flack song that you recorded on the original version, and then did your own version, you know, a few weeks later that also got radio play, your duets. I think you have two duets with your daughter, you know, two album collaborations with your daughter. Um, you definitely stayed a moving target. And, and also, of course, foreplay. You know, I'd, I'd be remiss to not mention two things that are really prominent in your career. Foreplay, one of the best bands in our genre of music. And also your, um, <laughs> your basic, uh, the, your collaboration in a sense in the hip hop world with your music, you know, those, those are two things that are, are, don't seem to be, you know, fit in the same sentence, but they absolutely do with you. Well, so we're talking about a lot of stuff and it, there, it is a byproduct of age. So <laughs> sure. if you hang around long enough, <laughs> One way or another, you do a lot of stuff. And, right. And uh, some, of them hope, some of them are highlights. And, right. And, and ho hopefully people forget about the lowlights. Yeah. So, yes, I've, I've had a long time doing it, and I have a, a lot of those kind of highlights. It's just very happy that it happened. But so many of them, when I start to zero in on them, those, those things that became highlights are the most to me, random, fluke, luck, weird, right. uh, didn't plan it, the things that, be, that became the most successful were not what I would have predicted if I had to lay out some strategy to say this is going to be successful. So and, and maybe the most dramatically crazy one was the hip hop world. Right, that absolutely. I never had anything to do with it. I still don't know what to do with it, <laughs> why they chose me. I no idea, uh, and, and 
am I unhappy about it? No, I'm, I'm for the most part very happy. Occasionally, I get chosen uh, to, to have my music be involved in some um, recordings that that go down a uh, profanity path that right. I wouldn't necessarily want to be associated with, or mm -hmm. stuff like that. But for the most part, uh, it's given me opportunity to have young people talk to me and have a kind of respect or uh, admiration for the way we did things back in the olden days mm -hmm. <laughs> before before strategy happened and before looping happened and before all of this stuff right um uh, I, I i i don't know but that definitely uh, is a great example of, uh, of the, the the good aspect of doing a lot of stuff, doing mm -hmm. a wide variety of stuff, which we talked about early on. And I have, I did have a chance to do a lot of that. And my wife told me, keep doing it, keep doing a whole lot of stuff, because you never know when, when uh, you know, you pull that the machine in Las Vegas and right. it comes up three cherries or, or whatever it is. Hey, right. You, hit it on that one. <laughs> you don't know why, but. It, well, like you said, there's there's a lot of happenstance and and luck and <clears throat> sort of um, it's not that you didn't have a plan, but but for me as well as you, like I'm I'm reminded most of the amazing things that have happened in my career, the biggest things have happened because I was just open to something coming through a side door or there was a little bit of a fluke factor that I said yes to, even if it wasn't exactly how I envisioned it, I turned it into something or it became something bigger. Uh, and I think yeah. it's, it's kind of a really good way to go through life. It certainly has served you and continues to. I can think back in college and people that, I, that were giving me advice or the, the kind of uh, strategy that I can remember thinking about even when I first uh, moved to New York. Uh, um, the basic thought process was you will get a break. And whenever people say to me or anybody that they can't get a break, mm -hmm. they really can't get a break, it's a, kind of the, the wrong way to look at things because somehow or other, I firmly believe that everybody has that moment or that break or that something and it is what you grab and take and are able to take by being prepared in life to hit it and nail it when when your break happens. But if you're not prepared, if you're not taking care of all the rest of your life and you're practicing and you're uh, staying clean and uh, mm -hmm. healthy and everything else, that's the place where we have the opportunity to, to have a much better chance of, uh, of utilizing and taking advantage of that break that happened and, right. and not blow it. I'm really glad to hear you say that. I couldn't agree more. So I could go all day with you, <laughs> but, um, but I would say, why don't I get to our closing questions right now? Uh, since, since the show is called Making It, what does making it mean to you both personally and professionally? And also, can you share three tips for success that have driven your career? Yeah, I think we were, I think we were hitting at it. Uh, yeah. That, that, uh, one of the tips would definitely be be prepared, be good, be as good as you could possibly be so that when you get your chance, your break, your whatever, that you, you can give it your best and, and don't just think that any of those things are going to happen automatically to your life. Um, bass player that I loved for so many years, who was also one of the names in my Black Lives Matter list, Gary King. Uh, he, he always referred to being humble. And so that, 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 that idea of being not taking yourself too seriously, not um, just 
keep yourself in perspective of being hopeful. Always very fortunate. And third tip, don't pay any attention to Bob Jones. He doesn't know what kind of he's talking about. <laughs> It's just so lucky to hear that. That's probably the best tip I should not give anybody. Duly noted. <laughs> uh, Bob, so what does making yeah. it mean to you both personally and professionally? Having the opportunity to enjoy this wonderful process of making music. Uh, the process of doing it to me has always been and will always be more important than making it. Making it, yes, is the livelihood part. I'm proud of the, the, that I've had music as my only professional way of having a livelihood. And I've been able to get paid well enough that I've had a comfortable, nice life and, and supported my family. So making it in that way has been uh, important. But uh, the the making, the idea of making it the way I see some young people go off the track is by having the, the wrong uh, outlook uh, or wrong uh, dream of seeing somebody else. They don't, they're not seeing themselves, so they, they I want to be famous. For mm -hmm. But whatever that means, it doesn't, uh, it's very unlikely to lead to that thing if they're having that kind of mindset. And the most reliable thing that stays with you always is if you love the process of what you're doing. If that way, you, they can't take that away from you. If it, if it doesn't, if what you're doing doesn't sell millions or it doesn't make you famous or whatever, you still had the, pleasure of act, just doing it in that uh, process. And for me, uh, being able to do that, have that be my life is just great. I wouldn't trade it for anything. Uh, I still love it, whether I get paid for it or not, or, or even whether anybody listens to it or not. Now I can be here in my room uh, all day. Nobody's right. here except the squirrels, and I still <laughs> love it. Yeah, the process. Be beautifully said. Yeah, that's that's one of the biggest gifts for me in in the way music has touched me is the actual creative process. And and yeah. just and the most the most wonderful and powerful and fascinating mm -hmm. and never ending um, adventure and challenge and all of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to give you uh, last words, but my final question before that is at this point of your life, uh, with, with everything that you know to be true, what would you tell your younger self if you had the opportunity to, you know, little six-year-old, eight-year-old Bobby? Yeah, following up, following up on our theme, I, <laughs> I, would, I would tell my younger self to practice <laughs> um, more at that age because that's the time when you, all your habits get formed. And any good habits or any but you also technique or skills or things, that's when your mind is at the most fresh and that and, and habits. The, the lazy habits or the, the flaws are also established during that time too. Right. So how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. Mm -hmm. Bob, um, any closing thoughts, final words, anything on your heart or your, your mind that you want to share to close this conversation off with? Sure. I very much enjoyed talking to you and getting to know you a little bit through this interview. Uh, I very much appreciated your, uh, I know you did some background research and uh, I, I thought very comfortable having this conversation mm -hmm. and uh, I hope we meet in person uh, soon. I hope I have the opportunity to come back to LA in, in a non-pandemic way. I look forward to that. And I um, wanna thank you for your time, for spending uh, 
the the hour plus with me and our listeners and and please continue to stay safe and inspired in everything that you're doing bob thank you thanks everybody for joining us that was great thank you uh if i can <laughs> right by the way that the hour went by fast. i was looking Doesn't at the it? clock I... over here and I'm, doing a, I'm doing a lot of yak yak so. no it, it's crazy yeah. i mean it's really amazing and the, the i think part of it is the the freedom just the freedom to have an unedited conversation is so luxurious you know i mean when do we get to do that besides sitting in an airport you know or a lobby call or you know on a plane or something it's just it's um it really fly it does fly by yeah you, know. you made me feel very uh comfortable about talking about the black lives matter thing that was very kind of pregnant and it yeah. just happened and i wasn't really sure how i was going to talk about it too because yeah uh, there's just there's definitely this I know that I'm the white guy that's comfortable up here in my bastion of uh, uh, what right do I have to preach? It's right. Bad. And, right. Uh, and that's what I, I didn't want, but, uh, but I can also tell my truth and surrender to that. Yeah. And, uh, so yeah, I know. It's been through. That you brought it up and then I felt okay that we didn't go down any dangerous paths. I yeah. Think. Now I, I, I gave it a lot of thought. I even asked Melanie, my, my wife, you know, I said, cause she saw the video too. And <clears throat> she was, she was very touched by it. And I said, is there anything you want me to ask or say to Bob? And she goes, no, just, you know, I know, you know, you guys will, you already have the right, way of looking at this. So, you know, just, just the fact that you're going to talk about it is great. I was, um, I was originally going to lead with it, you know, but it didn't, you know, I mean, doing these interviews, they're, they are conversations. So it's like playing music for me. You know, I do prepare. I mean, <clears throat> I likely could have had this conversation without doing the research because I've been following your music you know, for both of our careers for many, many years. But, um, you know, I'm, how old am I? I'm 63. So I'm younger than you, but old enough to, you know, I'm Nathan's age, you know, so we, we've, we all have the same, you know, point of view. Um, but, you know, preparing for it makes just for a much more interesting conversation. And then also, it, it's not that hard to listen you know, if you're a musician, I mean, that's what so much of it is based on. So you're where you took the conversation. You know, I'm, I knew I wanted to mention your wife and, and that I didn't want to be indelicate about it. And cause, but I knew how important it was to you and I knew how important this video was to you. So I, we just, I guess it just kind of found itself in the natural place in our conversation. I'm glad you were comfortable. That makes me, I feel good about that. Thank you. I was. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty, pretty amazing. I just, yeah. It's so great to have the time to just to get to talk with you and to get to know you a little bit as well. You know, not just, yeah, a quick introduction, you know, 10 years ago or wherever, you know, we might have met. So, um, so can I uh, get you to just do a, a voiceover? Uh, just yeah. basically, hi, this is Bob. You can say anything you want. It can be funny, playful. Um, Jean-Luc Ponty did one in French, you know, which was really funny. But you just, it's saying this is, you know, p pianist, composer, Bob James, you're listening to Making It with Terry Wallman. Just used for promos for the show. Making, making It with Terry Wallman. Yep. That's, that's the fun. <laughs> making It with Terry Wallman, yes. Hi, this is Bob James. I'm a jazz pianist, composer, and um, very much trying to make it with Terry Wallman. And uh, that's why I'm telling you that we're doing making it with Terry Wallman. And I'm very proud to have been a guest with Terry. And this is 
making it with Terry Walden. Thanks, Bob. That's great. So I will, um, th I'm not sure when this will be out, yeah. but I'll let you and Sonny know. Uh, I'm gonna try to get it to the great. network as soon as possible so that they can release it. It'll be in the, probably in okay. the next couple of weeks. Uh, um, sadly, um, Black Lives great. Matter, you know, is still gonna be relevant, you know, in a week or four weeks or, you know, this is, it's ongoing. More, um, more. Yeah, well, of course, our, our lifetime and, and further. Um, is there anything in particular you want me to name this episode? We, we normally like, you know, have like some sort of a little tag or punchline, or do you want me to come up with something and run it by you or? Yeah, I, I, I'd let you do it I, I off the top of my head. Okay. Uh, we seem to have a little stream that, uh, Mm. I'll leave it up to you. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, and also, I'm pretty sure that the answer is going to be yes when I reach out to Blue Microphones with Kevin and Walt, who you've met. But do you, do you want me to, if he says yes, do you want me to just have him email you and he can ask for your address to send you a, one of these, the Yetis, and then you could use it for all oh, your, sure. your stuff? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I I can do you do a nice little promo by having it be kind of prominent there on the uh, screen if you're doing whatever. But I could do that too. With my, yeah. So yeah. That, okay. But it would be seen as a, yeah. No okay. Problem. Yeah. I'll, I'll I'll text him today yeah. and then and then send an email to you both on that because he's he actually he has said in advance he said if you ever want me to send a blue a yeti out to anybody that you're going to be interviewing. You know, if it would be helpful, you know, let me know. You know, so I mean, I said I wouldn't, I wouldn't abuse the privilege, but um, I, he already knows you and everything, so I don't think it's going to be a problem. So let, let me just see if I can make that happen. Cool. Okay, um, and I'll one, shoot you. One other thing. Oh yeah. Yeah. One other, one other thing. If you do a project of, uh, that uh, becomes successful by you putting it out on cassette. I want a percentage of it for giving you that idea. <laughs> well, there, there wouldn't be stranger ways to make a living in the music business. <laughs> the new trend. You know, some, I'm, I'm open to any kind of that, you know, I would love to split a royalty with you on my cassette sales. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> That's good. And you know, stranger things are happening. It seems exactly goofy, goofy oh, to us. Yeah. But you never know. Wow. Yeah. So on that note, <laughs> that's my that's my business idea of the day for you. Okay. Duly noted. Um, what's the best way to stay in touch? Through text or through email? Which do you prefer? Either either way. Okay. Um, you know, it's funny, that's a really great question that I want to ask Sonny too, mm -hmm. because it, without thinking about it, without having any strategy, we have started splitting off and sometimes he'll give me an appointment or whatever by text message and sometimes by email. And when I trace them down, but I normally would be thinking there's going to be email, and if I can't find anything, I can't remember where is the thread. Oh, of me this too. That had this comment coming up, and it is confusing to be in two different things. And then also, people now through Facebook use the iMessenger, whatever the whatever the. I was. I asked like Sonny. That. I know. It's there all the time. So I got three different places. They get lost. There's too many opportunities to not communicate with it. About it. No, beca because yeah, he. Sonny, I don't think he's really uh, zeroed in on that because half the time he'll send me an email and the other half of the time it'll be a text. So uh, I don't know <clears throat> the answer. I'll just have to check both. I, okay, I agree with you as well. I almost missed um, Sonny's message yesterday the, about that you're available today because it was through Messenger. I don't check Messenger. You know, so I, I, okay, so I, that's, 
exactly what happened to me because I'm looking around. I know, I know. I'm supposed to be doing something today because I remember it, but yeah. I couldn't remember the exact time. And I'm looking at all my emails. I couldn't find it. Yep. That was the reason. Yeah, I got the same okay. thing. I, I, I both. Yeah, you can support me on that. I already, I, I sent, I wrote back to Sonny. I go, please reach out to me on my phone or email. Those are the two places that you can find me, you know, not messenger. Yeah. So yeah. I said, cause I, I told I him yesterday. Yeah. Like so we'll both beat up on him. I will. Yeah. I'll hold him. You hit him and then we can rotate. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Um, and by the way, I, I actually, uh, I think it'd be really wonderful to have you on one of my tunes if you're open to it. Uh, sure. yeah, I'm, I'm actually, okay. I'm working on a couple of things, you know, I'm doing, we're all doing our isolated stuff right now anyway, but, um, I'm even collaborating with Jerry Hay remotely right now on a tune, you know, so, uh, so we're just all kind of using the time to well, figure it a, out. I have a really tough manager. But yeah. Do you want me, should I go through Sonny on that? No, that was a joke. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. That's the only thing I just wanted to warn you about. Yeah. <laughs> hey, he's got your best interest at, at heart, and you know he's been doing this a long time. Uh, I'll see, okay. I, I'll keep that in mind because I'm working on a few things, and and uh, I'm going to make a space for you. I think it'd be really really fun. Great. Cool. All right. I will talk to you soon. And it's such a pleasure for me as well. You too, Bob. Thank you. Good to see you. Okay. Tune in again next week for another great episode of Making It with Terry Woolman.